Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by the cryptocurrency Shiba. I bought some, so now everyone should. Episode 216, Creating React Native as a Service at DraftBit, with Peter Pikarczyk. So I have to tell this story about when I first met our guest today on the podcast. Uh, it was actually in Poland, of all places. Uh, we were both there for React Native EU 2019. And, you know, we had known each other online, uh, but not, you know, this was the first time we'd met each other. And uh, so Peter's like, hey, let's get coffee. So we got together, went over to a nearby coffee shop in Wroclaw, which I don't think I said right. And, uh, and Peter proceeds to order coffee in fluent Polish, which he's like, he lives in Chicago. Like this is not something I was expecting. All of a sudden he's just speaking fluent Polish. I'm like, wait, how do you know Polish? <laughs> like, did you just learn it for this trip? He's like, no, no, I, I'm fluent. I, I know, I know Polish. Uh, I guess he's, you know, Polish American or something like that. So, uh, that was, that was kind of a interesting sort of uh, just took me aback a little bit. I'm a Finnish American. And I had spent some time in, in Helsinki, but no, I wasn't able to do the same thing. I, I did start learning Finnish later, but not I, did, I didn't know any at the time. So I couldn't repeat that, that, uh, that little trick that he did there. That was, that was pretty cool. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Uh, I appreciate you coming on, Peter. Uh, I will introduce you in just a second. Of course, I'm Jamin Holmgren, your host and friendly CTO of Infinite Red. I'm joined by my sublime co-host, Mazen Chami. He lives in Durham, North Carolina. He's a former pro soccer player and coach and a senior React Native engineer here at Infinite Red. Uh, we do not have Harris or John Major today. And of course, Robin is on maternity leave. So we are going to wing it on our own, uh, do the best that we can. Uh, and of course, here with us is our special guest, Peter Pikarczyk, who is the co-founder and CTO of DraftBit. He lives in Chicago. He's an avid cyclist and a musician. In fact, you've got a synthesizer in the background, Peter. Is that something that you uh, you play a lot or is it just, you know, just for looks? Yeah. Uh, the synthesizer for the listener is the Mini Moog Voyager XL. Uh, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails made this very popular. You know, he made all of his music on this synth. And then when he switched to soundtracks, he also made all of the soundtracks for movies on this. That's the uh, synth claim to fame. And yes, I do, I do enjoy playing it. My partner and I will make silly songs in our off time together. We'll just riff something up. She likes to sing. I like to play. And so we'll, it's our own private collection of silly songs. I love the silly songs angle. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's awesome. That's, that's just, yeah. Uh, I, I grew up in a family of musicians and I was the one who inherited mo mostly none of that. Uh, <laughs> I do... <laughs> I do have a bass guitar in the background, which I can play a little bit, but I mean, you know, the fewer strings, the better. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about string instruments as well. <laughs> <laughs> I sing a bit, like I, I sang in a choir for a little while and stuff, but like, uh, you know, I, the rest of my family is just like amazing. We get together and there's, there's music going on. They can play everything. It's, it's incredible. And then I'm sitting there like, okay, I can program. Uh, but yeah, this, this episode is sponsored by Infinite Red, a premier React Native design and development agency located fully remote in the U.S. and Canada. If you're looking for React Native expertise for your next React Native project, hit us up. You can learn more on our website, infinite.red slash React Native. And don't forget to mention that you heard about us through the React Native radio podcast so that Mazin and I can keep our jobs because that's important. Please do. <laughs> and also we are hiring if you're senior level. Located US or Canada, go to careers.infinite.red. All right, let's get into our, not our topic, but our guest today. Let's talk to our guest. And uh, Peter, this is, I, I, I've actually been really looking forward to this one because DraftBit has been around for a, a few years now. Uh, when was it started? Oh, man. Uh, 2018. Sometime in 2018, I think. Okay. Before we were a low code, no code, before somebody gave us that label. It was before the no code labels is when we, we right. started. Yeah. That's sort of the era that that's, that phrase or that, that nomenclature kind of came around and was like, 
you know, became a thing. I know Webflow, for example, was a good example of that on the website, which we do use for our website, by the way. And uh, it was like, okay, people have been trying to do this forever. You know, I started web coding with Dreamweaver. <laughs> yeah. And it was supposed to be drag and drop, but like uh, kind of mostly failed uh, over the years. Uh, but then it seems like things have started picking up speed lately. Uh, I'd like to start with how you got into programming in the first place. Uh, we were talking a little before the, before the recording, and it's, it's kind of an interesting story. Well... I've always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit in me, and it all started at the young age of 10 or 11. My dad used to take me to the flea market and have me buy stuff and learn how to negotiate and bargain with people, you know, cash. And then I would take the things that I would buy and sell them on eBay. And that's where I got my eBay account, all running under my dad's name. Fast forward a couple of months, I discovered Photoshop and Dreamweaver and started messing around. Every like waking moment I had outside of school, I was messing around with Photoshop and Dreamweaver. And then I decided to start selling logos and websites on eBay. I think I, I was charging like $75 for a logo or $300 for a website. These were static HTML sites built in Dreamweaver for random people that happen to be looking for website templates on eBay. That, that's amazing. Uh, and I feel like there are a lot of stories like that where people, you know, maybe they were trying to customize their MySpace profile or they were, you know, Neopets or, any, and, you know, like there's a lot of different things where, where people wanted, they had sort of a, an idea and there was some sort of a platform that gave them some capability, but not like, it wasn't like a full on, hey, I'm going to, start, I'm going to be a software engineer, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. There is a second part of this story too, that I'll we'll be brief about. So I actually stopped coding in college for the first two or three years, uh, maybe two, I forget. So I just like gave it a break. I also, and this is today is actually the 11 uh, year anniversary of this, Oh wow! Uh, which I found on Facebook. But in college, I threw a lot of concerts and shows. We brought uh, Big Sean down and uh, Wiz Khalifa and Currency. So again, I was always like, you know, entrepreneurially driven and I was throwing these events with a few other friends. And today, 11 years ago, I got to drive to Ohio with Big Sean for the next leg of his tour which was that's a pretty awesome cool, yeah that's awesome oh and that's how i got back into programming because i would build all the ticketing portals and all the things that weren't available so you know that was just like hacking together php and paypal and random things uh so yeah. after a short break you know again i came back to programming through wanting to make money <laughs> <laughs> You seem to be the rare mix. Like there, a lot of times there's developers who love the coding side of it. Like, and I, I would put myself in that slot where I'm, I'm just a tech nerd. I look at the code. I, I love it. And then there's the side who's like the less code, the better. I'd, I'd like to just get something done and hack it together. And I don't care what the code looks like as long as it's reasonably maintainable. Uh, it's all about what I can make. You seem to be the rare sort that both things motivate you. Yeah, for sure. I think maybe the older I've gotten or the longer I've been uh, a founder of, you know, these the SaaS startups, I lean more towards the less code I write, the happier <laughs> I am. But I still enjoy it. You know, I still mess around with things like Rescript and getting, right. you know, I was early on React Native and Expo. So there is still that joy of exploring new technologies. Yeah. And I think your your startup kind of shows that journey a bit where you are trying to make it easier for the, you know, the, the second group, the people that just want to get stuff done and, and aren't as, you know, worried about making the perfect data yeah. architecture or whatever. You got it. So building on that, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is DraftBit and how did it come to be? Yes. So DraftBit is a self-service platform to help you build your React Native or Expo app faster. And what I mean by that, it's a it's a, a as we fit in the low code department because there is a visual aspect to it, and then there's also a coding aspect to it as well. Uh, the DraftBit platform will start you off with an app with authentication and navigation, and you know your base sort of Expo app. 
And at any given time, you can export that source code. I think that's like the big difference of what we're doing is you get access to the source code. Source code is a first class citizen for us. So while you're dragging and dropping elements onto the page, your components, or you know, writing a couple helper functions, you know, because of something that we don't support uh, natively in the platform, at any given time, you can see the source code that uh, we generate for you, and then download the whole thing too if you choose to decide to bounce. That's awesome. That, I mean, the the GIF you guys have uh, on your homepage is pretty cool, and it kind of shows the full capability of the UI aspect, and kind of also shows. Um, but you guys support fetching, which I think is pretty cool, a pretty cool feature that you have. I also see on your website that you and two other co-founders are out there. How did how did DraftBit come to be? How did you guys meet? Yeah, uh, good question. Chicago is a very small world. So we, I originally met my co-founder, Brian, first. We were working out of the same co-working space at the time. I was at a different startup we were trying to do, and this was like 23 or 24 year old Peter, we were trying to do a kayak for food delivery services. But uh, fun fact, nobody gives a crap about saving a dollar <laughs> versus, you know, versus like kayak or whatever, you're saving hundreds of sometimes, right? Nobody gave a crap if like it was a uh, dollar extra on Uber Eats over Lyft or whatever, Seamless, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. So anyway, at that time, we started talking. I had another friend, my former boss at Trunk Club, uh, who was really encouraging me to become a founder and made a lot of intros for me. He introduced me to Brian. Mm. Brian was CEO of OkCupid okay Labs out in San Francisco. And uh, his boss, the founder of OKCupid, Sam Yegan, sold the business to Match.com. And then that group of them moved to Chicago. That's where they started Techstars, uh, the Chicago office before it was called that. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of like put together like the foundation of this modern startup tech scene in Chicago, which I started getting involved in. So eventually I got to meet Brian and we just hit it off and started uh, working on uh, an app together. My first job out of school, I started working at One North, which was a really great agency. We built legal websites. And one of my friends there, Donald, uh, and I, we you know worked on random things together. We were both really into Node.js. Uh, and, you know, got to work on those projects together. Donald and I stayed in touch afterwards uh, for a year or two. Uh, and then one day Brian says, hey, I've got a recommendation on a really great, you know, developer in person that should join us. And it was Donald. So mm. that's how the three of us uh, sort of came together and started working on Orchard at the time, which was, you know, a different startup. I know it's a little bit of a long-winded story. Hopefully it, yeah. it followed. No, yeah. So like, how did you pivot then from Orchard into, into DraftBit? So uh, we got into YC for Orchard, moved out there, did that whole spiel. Orchard was a way to manage your personal and professional connections. It was an app that would try to connect everything from Facebook to Google and build that whole relationship graph. With all the API and privacy changes and things taking place, it was nearly impossible to build. The folks, uh, both Brian and Donald knew that I was like really into the React Native world, right? I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was Expo's first user. I don't know if many people know that or not, but uh, Charlie and James Brent and I built, the, built an app uh, together and I got to check out their platform and I was ab absolutely obsessed. And when we started realizing that Orchard wasn't going to make it, we pursued a couple different ideas. Uh, we built this thing called Twitter Prospector, which was a way to help you find recruiting candidates through your Twitter network. That didn't really stick. Uh, we also built a YC networking uh, app. So for folks mm -hmm. in the YC uh, family, it was an easier way to make intros and to uh, meet each other. There wasn't really much going on there either. And so finally, we took one of my favorite things, which was Expo and tried building, you know, different pieces of things that we've built in the past visually just to see. The first version of DraftBit, the P like proof of concept is still running on Netlify somewhere. Like it's just this like 
uh, piece of crap, you know, boxes with the generated JSON, which we then, you know, turned into like something uh, fancier throughout our time. But we started realizing that thanks to the way that Expo does live preview and all these other things, we are capable of being able to build a full app in the browser without ever having to install anything locally. So that mm -hmm. got us all excited. And then that's where DraftBit was born. You mentioned YC, Y Combinator, the, the seed money accelerator. Uh, how, how did you kind of get connected in there? And then like, what role did that play in DraftBit's genesis? We applied to YC and through some hustling, I think we were able to land ourselves a spot. Mm. I think YC is a really great opportunity if you take it. This may uh, be an unpopular opinion and not to be taken out of context, but I don't feel like many people do take advantage of that YC experience, mm. which is sometimes you'll see pros and cons. It is a very competitive, very competitive program because you're really fighting for your partner's attention to help take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. So in a cohort of 100 companies, uh, most of them statistically fail within the first year. So none of our other batchmates, except for maybe Universe, uh, Joe Cohen, who is a freaking all-star, and Repolit, which is Amjad Massad's company, are alive. Maybe there's a handful of others, but you know the point is there's not many left. So during that time, you are showing off your growth, your charts and graph. Naturally, as human beings, uh, you get excited when you see charts, right? So by fighting for your partner's, uh, partner's attention, you are able to, you know, grow faster and double down, right? Which is not the experience for many people who realize that the thing that they're working on isn't the right idea, right? It's, it's not like school where you take a test, right? And you pass and that's how you know you pass because you got an A. With startups and business, it's like, well, if you're not growing, you got to figure out how you're going to grow, right? There is no secret. You know, there is, it's, I don't know if what I'm making sense, I'm realizing that I'm starting to ramble here, but <laughs> no anyway, worries. I'll just say that I really enjoyed my time at YC. I made some really great friends and uh, founders that I still talk to on a regular basis uh, now. So my personal experience with YC was phenomenal. Yeah, that's awesome. Given your entrepreneurial background and also your develop, developing background, uh, what advice would you give to like early stage startups or just anyone in the startup world? Because I know that, you know, we might have some users that are listening to this podcast for, for advice and also help. I know I was, I was one of those listeners working at a startup, trying to get my startup off the ground a couple of years ago. It's a great question. Uh, the number one piece of advice that I've learned the hard way, uh, actually there's two, but I'll start with one that I have learned the hard way is communication and learning how to communicate with your other founders and learning how to deal with disputes and uh, work on conflict resolution and working towards understanding what each person's trying to say rather than immediately making an opinion and getting upset or, yet, or whatever. That I learned the hard way as somebody who, you know, would may not always give somebody the benefit of the doubt. And I've learned through that time that I'm not the only one, right? We all struggle with conflict here and there. So working through that uh, was a really important skill. The number two most valuable advice that I believe is worth talking about is uh, focus. Uh, focusing on what your customer wants and focusing on making sure that your customer is successful. Uh, going back to the coding for fun versus coding for business, uh, there is a fine line of how much time you should be spending on like perfecting your design system or your homepage or whatever. My recommendation to the founders out there is to focus on getting your product out there, the bare minimum requirements, no matter how crappy it is, and getting it in front of one or two or three people and deeply listening to them, synthesize that information and build it as fast as you can so you can get to the next uh, stage, which is figuring out what you have to do after that. 
Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that's some great advice right there. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And even with, uh, obviously we're a consultancy, so a little different story, but, but for us, you know, there's three owners and we have, uh, we have invested a, probably some people might think, uh, a ridiculous amount of time in in just spending time together and getting to know what drives each other and talking about various things. I mean, we had this exercise just recently where we envisioned a future for Infinite Red and we each came up with five. Like, what are five different futures for Infinite Red? What could we envision? Uh, that envisioning exercise is interesting because then we can, you know, say, okay, what if uh, someone wants to buy us and have that conversation before the offer is sitting there on the table, you know, yeah. <laughs> where it could cause a conflict. and. Uh, you know, we, we like, we were able to talk through it in a low pressure situation. And I, I love what you said there about like not making assumptions about motivations and things like that. And actually sitting down and like tr really trying to understand, I think it's important to, uh, try to achieve clarity even more than trying to achieve like, uh, consensus, you know, like trying to really understand what the other person is under, you know, is, is trying to say maybe to the point where you can say it better than they could, you know, try to be, to get to that point so that they feel heard so that they feel like, you know, you're on your understanding. If there's still a disagreement that can, that can still happen, but you can work through it. That conflict resolution side of it is so important because honestly, you could have the best business in the world, but if the owners have a falling out, the business dies, you know, or it yep. changes in a very fundamental way. Awesome. Bringing it back to DraftBit, what, uh, you mentioned earlier that you're using Rescript. Can you just give a quick explanation to what Rescript is and why you guys are using it in your product? Yes. For starters, I love Rescript. I have to sell it. Rescript was created by the creator of React, Jordan Walk. It had a different name back then called Reason. Uh, as things mature or as you learn what a product should look like, you make changes to it. React at Facebook was originally written in something called standard ML. It was not written in JavaScript. It was then converted to JavaScript and released to the public in 2012 or 2013, whatever. It's been so long now. <laughs> JavaScript obviously has its own hiccups. And over the years, we've been able to get gifts from many, many people and now have really great pipelines and flows. Jordan at Facebook saw this vision well before we had Prettier and TypeScript and all these things of being able to build really safe apps that compiled to readable and fast JavaScript. Unlike some of the hacks that we have to do to get TypeScript working, right? Like sometimes we write things that make our JavaScript slower to satisfy typing needs. Uh, sometimes we can get away without typing something by using any. Uh, sometimes we will do certain things just to make it work, which is great. Uh, don't get me wrong. I like TypeScript. We use TypeScript on our server. Uh, we write TypeScript every day, uh, and our client is all Rescript. Rescript, on the other hand, is based on OCaml. It's very fast. Compiling an entire app is counted in milliseconds, not minutes. It's very, very fast. It's also very type safe. So there is nothing, there's no concept of any. Uh, things are either going to be something or nothing, which means you eliminate a whole class of bugs like cannot read property X of undefined or null. All that disappears. Rescript looks a lot like JavaScript these days or TypeScript, like any of the types that you do have to add uh, ha follow that same format. It's a language that doesn't get in the way with your productivity. And what I mean by that is I don't need to type everything out. Things will automatically be inferred. And from here, sometimes here and there, uh, we do. Rescript offers a lot of futuristic JavaScript and TypeScript features, I believe, like pattern matching and variants and things that just have made DraftBit as a platform much more stable than any of the, you know, TypeScript that we write mm -hmm. on our server. Does that make sense? I know that's a hectic intro there. No, it does. It makes sense. I love, I honestly, one of the reasons I haven't dove into Rescript is because I don't want to fall in love with it. <laughs> I know that I would immediately be like, this is the, this is the thing we need to do this and bring it back. And then my team would hate me. Um, but 
you know, I mean, like, like if I'm if I'm doing a startup and we have full control over our stack, this would definitely be high up on the on the list of things that I would be uh, considering doing consulting work. Obviously, we sort of go for a little more of the common denominator with that. But I did. Uh, I haven't ever done Oca- OCaml. Um, I did. I did some Elm back in the day, and 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 of course Elixir, which has a really good like pattern matching uh, stuff. Yeah. Those those feature language features and just the ergonomics of it is like stuff I miss. You know, even just things like like uh, I assume Re- uh, Rescript has like like pipeline operators and things like that. Uh, lets you you know, which is coming to JavaScript, but it's it's been a while. Yes, and contrary to popular belief. Uh, you don't even know that it is using OCaml behind the scenes. Everything mm-hmm. is installed through NPM or Yarn. You just yeah. Yarn add Rescript to your project and everything just works. The difference is that it compiles so fast that you can't get up and get coffee or use the bathroom. <laughs> like you have to get back to work. <laughs> of course, that famous uh, comic of, of people playing swords in the in the hallway, yep. uh, compiling, compiling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that's pretty awesome, though. And of course, Rescript, then if there's Rescript uh, React Native, which brings in bindings to React Native itself. Who maintains that, by the way? I'm not sure. Uh, ironically, our client, the DraftPick client is written in Rescript, but the apps that we export are TypeScript because that's what most uh, folks want. That's what people want. want. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Very cool. So you you mentioned you were one of the earliest adopters of Expo, maybe the earliest. I don't know. Uh, what's that been like? I mean, you've been there kind of through the evolution of Expo from the very beginning. You know, how's that gone? It's been a really great journey. I am actually Expo's first user. I was mm. there the first day that um, it was called. It was a Electron app that you would download that would handle everything that you see in the browser now. And the company mm-hmm. was called Exponent at the time. Exponent, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been really inspiring watching them grow and all of the uh, accomplishments they've made. So Expo started as strictly a tool that would take the index.js bundle that you kept on the device for React Native and put it in the cloud. That's all they did at first. And their goal was for you to be able to write JavaScript and to avoid having to use those native modules. I, for one, appreciated that because I have no idea how to navigate through the iOS or Android code, or at least I didn't at the time and still choose not to. Uh, So it was it was fascinating back then. And it is more fascinating and exciting uh, for me today. Yeah, I would agree with that. We've, I guess, one of the things that I, I think I, I said as early as maybe 2017 that I think Expo is the the future of React Native. Like that's that's the way React Native is going to be written, and we're getting there. Like it's getting to the point. I mean, we're not there. There's still a lot of projects we do that are not Expo, but but like with uh, with a lot of what they do, it's it's definitely happening. And I think w- one of the reasons I really believed in that was they just have a great team. They have an amazing team, and they have a, a cool like vibe about them and. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great idea and it's cool how it plugs into DraftBit. Like it's cool how that those things are very, very, you know, in parallel. Um, it allows you to kind of help, 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 you know, do what you do. Just to confirm, Peter, you mentioned that when you're exporting your app from DraftBit, you can export a Expo app or a non-Expo app. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so when you export an app inside DraftBit, you are getting a fully functional Expo app with all the dependencies, including React Navigation and TypeScript and everything you need to build. Awesome. That's amazing. What Expo version are you guys on? Because I know now they are, they're on 42 and I believe 43 is in beta as of today. We are on Uh, SDK 42, and we've been in the SDK 43 beta for a bit, trying it in DraftBit. We're usually about Hmm. a week or two behind their uh, updates and upgrades, just because there are things that come up. And we actually help a lot with finding bugs in uh, the releases because we're such heavy users of all of their products. I guess all Expo users can thank you guys then for finding the bugs before they get to it. <laughs> I thank true. the Expo team for fixing all of them because sometimes 
it gets a little tricky. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, like, what are sort of the big challenges of of building DraftBit on React Native in general? Like, uh, you know, what what types of things have you run into that that you've had to kind of push um, through? We don't have very many technical challenges per se. We have this very extensive, well. You know, we do have technical challenges, but when it comes to the business, there, <laughs> there's different types of challenges that we focus on. But sure. right now we've got this very extensive on the fly compiler that compiles your entire project in less than uh, one second, which is pretty great. So whenever you make a change in draft fit, we recompile and we, we push it out to your phone, uh, to the web browser, uh, wherever, wherever you want that code to, to be previewed. And uh, this, is a, this compiler has done a really good job of supporting all of our use cases with some adjustments. Our biggest challenges are more on the product and business side, which is educating folks on how to build apps in general, especially React Native or Expo apps. A lot of our challenges revolve around authentication and navigation and serving the goals of our users uh, and sometimes guiding them in a different direction from what they think they want to build, which I'm sure you all have a little experience in as well. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine. And do you find that sort of the limitations of, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, for example, uh, they want to bring in a, a like a specialized SDK or something like that. Is there is there a point sort of where you're like, okay, you're going beyond what the scope of what we want to do? Or is there usually a way you can kind of uh, yeah. guide them around that? There's only been a handful of cases where we weren't able to support something. Things like VR or building a game. Those are just draft bit no-nos for you know various reasons. Mm, but yeah. most of the time, anything folks want to build, we can uh, support. Whether our worst case scenarios is uh, writing some custom code and sharing it with them with our snippets and saying, hey, this isn't productized, so we just kind of whipped it up for you. You can use that in your app. But most of what Expo offers and most of the things that our users want uh, work really well together. I honestly feel like, so I, I've been on my my Twitch stream, I've been rebuilding the Chain React app in Expo. I honestly feel like I could totally do this on DraftBit too. Like I could, uh, the, the capabilities that are built into uh, the Chain React app are totally possible in 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 draft bit and so that might be something i need to to tackle at some point too i i like using the chain react app as a uh of course that's our conference app uh as a test bed because it's not a to-do app it's yeah. not your basic stuff it, it has a real purpose and you know and then i could uh, actually kind of explore what's ca what's capable so might might try that at some point yeah okay. give it a shot hit me up we're always looking for folks to break draft bit because when you're trying, when you're allowing people to build whatever you want, there's a large surface area for things to break. So totally. With that being said, what's new or on the roadmap in the future for DraftBit? One of the most exciting things that our users are looking forward to is React Query. Contrary to what I thought was going to be the case where things like Firebase and GraphQL were going to be popular. REST is still overwhelmingly much more popular, especially for beginners, than any other platform out there. So for us, we wanted to build a much better experience around uh, REST in your app. So we're on the verge of launching uh, full React query support. And we do a lot of like fun tr tricks behind the scenes to make it all work really nicely together. So you'll have all the fun caching and features of that library without having to worry about how it works. Obviously, SDK 43, I happen to be very excited about this specific release because it removes re Expo uh, unimodules, which was a little complicated to understand. And then it also pegs the React Native version back to what's available on NPM rather than an Expo specific uh, build. So typically Ooh, in your... I yeah, didn't know yeah. that. So there are some things that are going to make our lives even easier in SDK 43. That's amazing. That That is, yeah, that's huge news. We, we we're going to be doing uh, probably some more 
you know, exploring of, of the latest release. We just haven't gotten to that one yet. And that's a, that's a, that's yeah, a it's change. a very long, uh, change log and I read it pretty regularly just to make sure, obviously we have to, we have to think about all of our packages. Um, but it's been a really, really, uh, great experience so far. So on that note in the roadmap, do you guys have, are you guys thinking about exploring other platforms? So other than mobile, maybe um, tablet, TV, uh, uh, desktop apps? Not right now. Our, the most exploring that we do is we have PWA support thanks to Expo. There are obviously many, many issues with trying to support something on native iOS and Android versus the web, especially when folks who don't necessarily understand how it all works work have expectations. For example, folks try to get uh, the web view, which is an iframe working, and they publish a PWA and wonder why their site's not loading. That's kind of a hard explanation. Mm -hmm. Like, no, sorry, this site will never load because of browser policy. Well, it works on iOS and Android. So that is always <laughs> a struggle of whether we uh, should support PWAs as well, uh, mobile only. But so far, mm -hmm. it has been slightly more uh, beneficial than hurting us. So we've been we've been keeping it around. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, this has been a fantastic uh, discussion, Peter. I know that we could probably I have a I have a bunch more questions, but we're kind of out of time here. If people have more questions for you, where can they find you on like Twitter? Where, where, they could find else? me on uh, Twitter under Peter P M E. Just one word. My personal website is Peter P dot M E, uh, hence that username. And then you can also check out the DraftBit community, which is flourishing with people all trying to build their own apps. So if you have a specific questions or wonder where the state of the platform is based on its community, check out community.draftbit.com and you can get a really good idea. Fantastic. Uh, Mazen, where can people find you online? At Mazen Chami. And I'm at Jamin Holgren. You can follow React Native Radio at React Native RDIO. Thanks so much, Peter, for joining us today. It was fantastic to chat with you to to get a uh, to catch up a little bit. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to see each other at some conferences and maybe in the next year or two. And as always, thanks to our producer and editor Todd Worth, our assistant editor and episode release coordinator Jed Bartoski, our social media coordinator Missy Warren, and our designer Justin Husky. Thanks to our sponsor Infinite Red. Check us out infinite.red slash React Native. Of course, go check out DraftBit DraftBit.com. Special thanks to all of you listening today. Make sure to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. We are React Native Radio. Uh, reminder, we are hiring. Go to careers.infinite.red and we will see you all next time. <laughs>